Hello, my name is Dan Piakash. I'm the head of healthcare and life sciences at DataArt, a technology consultancy and custom software development company that focuses on highly regulated industries. I want to thank you for taking the time to watch the video of our patient engagement innovation panel held on June 9th. DataArt helps healthcare organizations and software companies build industry-defining applications by providing end-to-end -end services from ideation to solution design, software development, and of course, support and maintenance. might actually, patient engagement might even be as simple as cycle for survival, where you're engaging the patient and their families in understanding and being part of a disease state. Uh -huh. Throughout the cycle of the health and wellness experience, how are you getting the patient to either do more or learn more or become more active in the entire ecosystem, which is their health? But how engaged are the patients today as uh, you know, my colleague said, there, there is no one-size-fits-all, so you have to ask very precisely. So there are typically a small number of very engaged patients. These are typically people who both have a relatively high level of um, health literacy, mm -hmm. um, as well as being, you know, which, which leads to a, a higher level of motivation. Uh, you also have a population of people who have chronic disease they can, they can manage. So your example was a good one. I think that the, the young diabetic, the type 1 diabetic population um, it is a highly engaged population because, you know, if any of us have a kid who has diabetes, we're going to be on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if you get to the, the child at the right age, they'll be engaged also. But overall, the level of people's engagement with health is quite low, mm -hmm. um, both from a wellness perspective and from a taking care of yourself. Yeah. I think there's, there's a gap, you know, between what we're seeing as the technology and the tools that are becoming available and, you know, the providers and the patients' use of those tools, as you said. And the problem is that there's a lot of, uh, you know, new sensors coming out almost on a daily basis. You know, everyone wants to measure your heart rate and, you know, your sleep patterns. But what are you doing with that data? And that data is not really coming to the healthcare provider. Who, do, who could potentially have valuable feedback, but we're not getting it because in one way we're kind of afraid of all of this data. If you think about big data, this is enormous data. How are we all gonna process this? So, you know, the analytical components are falling into place and uh, more pieces have to fall into place that will narrow the gap and now the device that you're wearing, you know, for fitness or for chronic disease or for wellness, you know, will have a connection to us you know, the provider systems, and we'll be able to give you the coaching that you're expecting from us that we can't do today. Right. And really change ourselves from what we are today, which is a, an acute care reactive system, to really a partner yeah. that, that helps, you know, avoid disease, not just treat disease. Who wants to come to the hospital unless you have to? But if we can change that image and really become a value added uh, and help you live well, and I think that's what we're all struggling to become, and that's, that's a real culture shift, so, you know, all the way from medical school to where we are today. It's, it's big. I, I agree with the panelist. I think the thing that's changed for us in terms of patient engagement is two or three years ago, we felt like we were trying to push patient engagement technologies, and early generations, we thought maybe the patient portal was the way to do that. But now we're getting a pull. Our patients expect to be able to access things like a mobile front door and functionality that just didn't exist years ago. So it's nice now to have our patients starting to say, here's what we expect out of you guys. And they're really giving us feedback as we develop those type of tools. Every single healthcare system I've spoken to recently in the, in the past year, not only do they have a patient engagement initiative, they usually have somebody with patient engagement in the title, and it's part of their specific strategic goal for the year to do something with patient engagement. Um, so I'm wondering, maybe Ashish, you want to comment, um, how long is it going to take us to get to a point where we actually see value on a large scale, when all of this actually comes together? I don't know. Um, I think it's going to be a long time. Um, I was talking with Sandy Myers, who is our patient experience officer, exactly what uh -huh. you told. Um, and I said, hey, tell me all the things that we're doing at Mount Sinai Health System. And she listed me at least five or six big endeavors. And then I asked her exactly the same question. I said, when would we have no patient gets left behind? Mm. Right? The, the technology we're bringing when it will be mass to every patient. And she said, I don't know. And, and I think part of the reason is 
there is so much innovation coming down the pike. We actually have a more of a problem than choosing which is the right innovation we need to bring into our health system. And we are so much bombarded by all these distractions or the new innovations that we don't even have to time to say, this is the one that's making an impact, mm -hmm. and let's now make it mainstream. Um, it's a very different ballgame than electronic health records. When it came 10 years ago, we knew this is a technology that now becoming mainstream, and now it has taken 10, 14 years to actually become mainstream. Um, I do think, ultimately, we'll have few technologies that will rise up, uh, but there's a big evidence gap. Um, all the pilots we are doing, we're not sharing results within our health systems. I have no idea what Northfield is doing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have any idea, um, you know, what Mont Montefer is doing, and I do not know which thing is working for them, and even right. I'm not publishing what we are doing at Sanar. Mm. Uh, so I think we need to create an ecosystem, uh, and we talked about Node Health or a network, where we can share and learn from each other, so I do not end up evaluating the same technology with Montefer is evaluating. Yeah. What's the precious use of it's not a great resource of my resources. Rather, if I learn from what Monty is doing and that is working, I may test a different technology and then share that with them. Mm -hmm. And then together we can say, hey, this thing is working really good. Let's adopt it, whether it adopts under this trip or adopts under these different initiatives. Yeah. Yeah. So, Definitely makes sense. How about uh, Montefiore? Well, so number one, we've kind of agreed to share. Okay. So we're going we're gonna to share our, our results. And no cheers on that, <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is big. From competition um, to collaboration, right? <laughs> But, but we, are, we are doing, uh, taking a patient engagement tool and putting it through really uh, almost a clinical level randomized study, which we've not done before. We're going to measure. We're going to measure if this, if this is having an impact. And uh, if we're measuring, you know, um, appointment adherence, we're putting it up against everything else that we're doing to that patient, including IVR and, uh, you know, care managers calling them up against, you know, this technology that automates this. And we're going to see if we're moving, you know, the level, if the automation is, is making a difference, if this patient engagement tool is making a difference. And what we've seen already in our study, which is three months old, uh, we've seen and identified issues that we have. Uh, and it's not just us, it's, it's the government and it's regulatory, because patients have to opt in. That, number one, is an obstacle. Three months into this, we have 30 percent. 40% of the population enrolled in the tool instead of 100%, and that's because it's an opt-in. And it's difficult, and patients would rather say no, because they don't understand, and there's nobody there to explain to them what this is going to do for them. So I think that's a big problem we're all going to face with any tool that we move forward. So that was number one. Number two, what we are seeing with the 40% that are in, they're engaged, because their communication's going back and forth. <coughs> that's very promising, because they are communicating with us. As far as are we you know, making a difference yet, it's for, you know, in medication, adherence, and, uh, and appointment adherence. Well, it's too early to tell because we only got 40% enrolled and they're kind of head to head. But the, the things that we are measuring right now and that we will hopefully publish and share afterwards is how to do a randomized study on such a tool and the benefits and, you know, the challenges that we're seeing with it. All right. So, uh, so far, we, we've got two health systems saying they're going to share. Is Northwell going to share also? Uh, let me just say that the opinions I expressed today <laughs> are, are not necessarily those of my employer. So we've got about five minutes left, if that. Uh, let's get two more questions. There's a question here. Uh, CEO David Feinberg, he says that the ultimate patient engagement tool is money back. So they offer a money back guarantee. You don't like your care, you don't have to pay for it. No questions asked. Well, two questions. One is what your name is, and two is where do we send the, the money. That's his, that's his speech. So I guess I'd just like to know from the panel, does that strategy sound appealing to you? Uh, is he out on a limb there? Do you think others will follow suit? This isn't uh, Best Buy, right? Like, you don't go and pay for it and then get your merchandise. If anyone's been to the doctor lately, what happens is you go, you pay nothing, generally speaking, and then you get a bill four to six weeks later. Right, so this concept of your money back, it's, it's more like all these providers and these health systems are generally going at risk and then hoping that you pay them, um, which is sort of the backwards part of the system. And Geisinger is in a different position because, <coughs> frankly, they are their own payer. It's a capitated system. So I, don't, I would say it's, it's a fairly, it's a bad analog, right, because all of the providers are going at risk because if you don't pay them, they have very little recourse. I don't understand the question. We pay our patients to come. 
Huh. So uh, they get free meals, they get uh, child care, uh, they get car service, and we have a farmer's market where we take them shopping so they learn nutrition. So we're actually bribing them to show up. Um, no money back guarantee required because they're actually walking away with more and hopefully good care. What a great brand ambassador, right? <laughs> <laughs>